Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. I'm pretty sure there's not an actual scientific classification yet, but along with Homo sapiens, we need to acknowledge a new subspecies called Homo blatodia. Blatodia is the genus that includes cockroaches, the nearly indestructible insect. And within that order, we should probably recognize two distinct lineages. First, there's Periplaneta fuliginosa, otherwise known as the smoky brown cockroach. That's how I'd classify Keith Richards. And then there's Periplaneta americana, the American cockroach. And if I'm sitting with my taxonomy flowchart, this is where I write the name John Frusciante, the let's call it occasional guitarist of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I use the word occasional deliberately because he's been in and out of the band a number of times over the last 30 years. As I write this, he is in, but who knows for how long. And I'm classifying him as Periplaneta Americana because despite everything he's been through, he is still alive. I mean, he's lived a hard life. Drugs, various health problems, both of physical and mental varieties, even dabbling in the occult. Yet through it all, he has been able to help the Red Hot Chili Peppers create the best music of the band's career. This is the long, strange trip of John Fusciante. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. The Red Hot Chili Peppers back in 1991 with the Blood Sugar Sex Magic album, the first to feature John Fusciante as guitarist. When that record came out, he was just 21 and had only been working as a professional guitarist for about three years. His contributions were so vital to that record that it took the Chili Peppers from, um, well, let's let's face it, a, a very good mid-level band to one of the biggest groups of that alternative era. That record has sold somewhere beyond 15 million copies. And that would have never, ever happened without John. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and John's story, and there's no other way to put it, is fascinating. It has all the dramatic elements. A young prodigy revitalizes an old band, but then he burns out, turns to drugs, nearly dies. Then comes a period of rebirth and redemption and a return to the Chili Peppers, where he once again takes them to new heights. And then he quits again to do his own thing, and finally, he joins the band for a third time, and things seem to be right with the world. For now. Oh, and in between all that drama, John found a time to release a ton of solo material. Some of it good, some kind of, um, well, let's call it head-scratchy, but we'll get to that. Let's start at the beginning. John is not from California. He was born in Queens, New York, where he grew up in a very musical family. Then they moved to Tucson, then Florida. Dad was a judge there. Before there was a divorce, and John moved with his mom to Santa Monica and then to Los Angeles. His stepfather really encouraged John's interest in music, and his first love was a punk rock band called The Germs. Simple stuff that used some really weird punk rock tuning, but it got him started. From there, he started studying the style of David Gilmour of Pink Floyd, Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, and Frank Zappa. And I should point out that all this was happening by the time John was 11. He was so into guitar that he convinced his parents that he should drop out of high school and let him study music full-time. The Chili Peppers came on John's radar when he was 15. This would be around 1984, just as the band released their debut album. He was always hanging around their shows, looking for a chance to talk to guitarist Hilal Slovak. John was such a fan that he learned all the Chili songs. But then Hillel died of a heroin overdose on June 25th, 1988, as the band was working on a new album. Drummer Jack Irons couldn't take it anymore, so he quit, leaving just Flea and Anthony to do something or not. They eventually decided to keep the band together. They'd settled on a guitarist named Dwayne Blackbird Knight, who used to play with George Clinton in Funkadelic, but he didn't work out for whatever reason. So they held more auditions. By this time, John was starting to attract attention from some serious people, even though he was just 17. Frank Zappa called, but since Zappa wouldn't condone anyone who used illegal drugs in his band, John decided that he'd better not go. Instead, he opted for a gig with Thelonious Monster, an L.A. punk band. Before that happened, though, he tried out with the Chili Peppers, connected by his appearance at all those shows. 
and by the fact that he was a friend of fire drummer D.H. Pellegro. By his own admission, he really didn't have the funk and didn't think that he was what the band needed. But the chemistry with Flea was good. They held a jam session, just the two of them, at Flea's apartment. And once that was over, Flea called Anthony and said, this kid has got to be in our band. Meanwhile, John went back to talk to Thelonious Monster, who offered him a job. Legend says that he was three hours into his membership with him when the Chili Peppers called and said, okay, you got the gig. This was October 1988. John was drafted in to complete the guitar parts for the new album Mother's Milk. D.H. Pellegro of the Dead Kennedys was briefly hired as a new drummer, like I said, but he didn't work out. And that's when Chad Smith auditioned and got the job in December, just a few weeks after John signed up. So by the start of 1989, the Chili Peppers had undergone a complete refurbishment. John was the new guitarist and Chad was the new drummer. This was the start of what would become the classic Red Hot Chili Peppers lineup. It debuted with nine songs on Mother's Milk. From the moment he got into the band, John and Anthony were best buds, hanging out all the time. This was fine at first, but in the end, a pretty bad idea. Anthony was working hard to be sober after going on a drugs and alcohol bender after Hillel died. John was this teenager who wanted to drink and do drugs and have sex 24-7. He thought this was how you were supposed to be a chili pepper, wild and wacky, in his words. He was also feeling the pressure of having to step into Hillel's shoes. And this would eventually become a problem, a big problem. For now, though, the Chili Peppers had to write and record a new album. And despite wanting to get high all the time, John was the guy who made this record happen. And he's the guy who turned the band into a monster. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's go back to the last full album with Hillel Slovak on guitar. That's 1987's The Uplift Mofo Party Plan. Take a listen to the way Hillel plays. He plays riffs and solos. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but listen. That's what we're going to call the old Chili Pepper sound. Then John Frusciante comes in with his hooky style of songwriting. His playing is more about melody. It's more sinewy, slinky, slippery. And, for whatever reason, Anthony became very comfortable with John's style. Actually, more comfortable than he had been writing and singing with Hillel. He became more confident with the young 18-year-old John, the guy the rest of the band called Greeny, and he was coaching him one-on-one. -on -one. Let's have a listen to one of the songs on Mother's Milk that features John. John's style isn't quite there yet. He's still in the stage where he's trying to emulate Hillel, probably the safe thing to do. And producer Michael Beinhorn convinced him to play in a more heavier way than he would have naturally. But even so, you can hear something coming. Did you catch some of those sonic differences? Like I said, it's early in John's Chili Pepper stints. But when we get to Blood Sugar Sex Magic, this is when everything changes. First of all, the Chili Peppers switch labels, moving from EMI to Warner. Second, they switch producers, dropping Michael Beinhorn and hiring Rick Rubin. And third, they found the perfect place to record this album. In April 1991, the Chili Peppers moved into a historic mansion at 351 Laurel Canyon Boulevard that was built in 1918. It had several famous residents over the years, including the magician Harry Houdini. Maybe. There's nothing to really prove that he did live there, although he did live up the street at something known as the Houdini Estate at 2400 Laurel Canyon. And there are apparently secret tunnels that connected it and other houses. Regardless, the house had a reputation as being haunted. Shortly after construction was finished, the son of a furniture store owner pushed his boyfriend from the balcony and he died and it's said that his ghost still roams the place. Or maybe it was the gangsters who were shot dead on the staircase during a Prohibition-era raid. Rick Rubin loved the vibe of the place. It was isolated and had no working phone. So he had a Canadian company come down and turn the basement into a recording studio suitable for the Chili Peppers. Chad Smith was allegedly too freaked out by the vibes of the place, so he refused to stay there during sessions. The other three guys did. They all had bedrooms. And John loved it. He was ready to sever himself from the outside world for a couple of months. Here's a quote. See what you can make of it. 
There are missiles flying through the city every day. They're aimed at everyone creative. They could be coming out of clocks or the television or a garbage can. And you've got to be aware of all of them all the time. Um, okay. And if the place was haunted, so what? John found it inspirational. There are definitely ghosts in this house, said John, but they are very friendly. Just in case, though, two psychics and a medium were called in to check the place out. And they left, um, well, they felt very uncomfortable. And maybe, just maybe, the ghost of that guy who went over the balcony made it into the sound of John's guitar. And now that you know that story, you're never going to be able to unhear that ghost again. We've all heard the story of Blood Sugar Sex Magic, which, by the way, was released on September 24th, 1991, same day as Nirvana's Nevermind. Huge record, six singles, 15 million copies sold, and it turned the Chili Peppers into this massive commercial and critical success. So, yay, right? Well, not really. Remember that the title of this show is The Long Strange Trip of John Frusciante, and it wouldn't be long before things hit the ditch for the first time. Hang on. When we follow the story of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, it's sometimes hard to convey things that are happening beyond the music. And we're going to have to try to do that if we're going to understand the long, strange trip John Frusciante has had with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Again, when he joined the band, John bonded with Anthony for a while. But because John was the partying type, and because Anthony was desperately trying to stay away from heroin, coke, and alcohol— he eventually had to put some distance between the two of them. That's when John started bonding with Flea. They would jam for hours, writing songs and then presenting them to Anthony and Chad. Just as Anthony became more melodic in his approach to singing after working with John, Flea's bass playing evolved too. He wasn't finger-picking or popping and slapping as much. He was becoming more melodic too, and that's John's influence. The tour that followed was amazing, and at one point, the Chili Peppers were joined by two new bands as openers. One was called The Smashing Pumpkins, and the other was Pearl Jam. Blood Sugar Sex Magic got bigger and bigger and bigger, and John became more and more morose. He wanted to be in a cool underground band. The success was way too serious for him. He didn't want to play arenas. He wanted small clubs. I quote Anthony Kiedis. He began to lose all of the manic, happy-go-lucky, fun aspects of his personality. Even on stage, there was a much more serious energy around him. John became depressed. There was tension between him and the rest of the band, especially Anthony. Weird grudges formed. And then when Nirvana started opening some shows for the Chili's, John found a soulmate in Kurt Cobain, a guy who also wanted his band to stay cool and underground. They bonded over that, which did not help. By this time, there were plenty of freaky Frusciante stories circulating. How he'd go out to eat, but insist on bringing his guitar with him, and then chain smoke between bites. He'd shaved his head on a whim. And then, for the European leg of the tour, John broke an important band rule. He brought his girlfriend with him. And when the band flew back to New York to play Saturday Night Live, Anthony was livid because he thought John sabotaged everything. The first song that night was Stone Cold Bush, and if you watch the video, it looks like Anthony gave John a kick. But it's with the second song, the performance of Under the Bridge, that was the final straw. Listen to John's guitar play. It's all woozy and weird. And then listen for him to blast his guitar and his vocals right at the very end. Was John high? Anthony thought it was possible that he was on heroin during that Saturday Night Live gig. After the show, Anthony really got into it with John, and that only made a bad situation worse. I quote, John was experimenting the way he would have if we'd been rehearsing the tune. Well, we weren't. We were on TV in front of millions of people, and it was torture. I started singing what I thought was the key he was playing in. I felt like I was getting stabbed in the back and hung out to drive in front of all of America while this guy was off in a corner in the shadow playing some dissonant, out-of-tune experiment. After the SNL incident, 
The Chili's took a two-week break to head back to Europe and then on to Japan, and things only deteriorated further. John hated the interviews. He hated the photo sessions and all the meet and greets. He felt he'd been reduced to a performing monkey. On May 7th, 1992, after just four shows in Japan, John refused to go on stage at a venue called Sonic City, just minutes before the show was supposed to start. I want to go home right now, he said. I quit. I've reached the stage where I cannot do justice to what I've created. I can't give you what it takes to be in this band anymore. Just tell everyone I went crazy. Which is really not far off the mark because he did say that there were voices inside his head telling him to quit. In the end, though, John agreed to play that one final gig in Japan. Needless to say, the 15-song set was bad. And it would be the last Chili Peppers show to feature John for six years. The band would explain his departure as an inability to deal with mental stress. And the other guys had their own stresses to deal with as well. Anthony with his continuing sobriety struggles and Flea who was going through a messy divorce. An attempt was made to bring in guitarist van der Schloss, a buddy from L.A., but there wasn't enough time to nail things down in rehearsals, so the remaining shows on the tour, including a bunch of big festival dates, were canceled, and everybody went back to Los Angeles. While the Chili Peppers regrouped, eventually bringing in a guy named Eric Marshall for a bit, it wasn't the same. Here's the band performing at Lollapalooza later that year. After the 92 Lollapalooza tour, Jane's Addiction guitarist Dave Navarro was brought in for one album. That's a whole other story that had an unhappy ending. But back to John. He wasn't just having a tantrum. He wasn't just going through a phase. He was out. In fact, he was mad at himself for not quitting sooner. I quote from John. It's my nature to do things that are weirder and less understood. And that was the path that I needed to take. And take that path he did. More in a moment. When John Frusciante got back to L.A. after quitting in the middle of that 1992 tour, he wasn't sure what he wanted to do. He auditioned for the Meat Puppets, the band from Phoenix, but that didn't work out. So he went home and concentrated on what he seemed to know how to do best, becoming a full-fledged junkie. He fell into a deep depression. At 23, he thought his life was over and he wouldn't be able to make music again. He would even pick up a guitar for a while. For the next three years, he barely left his home in Hollywood. The place fell apart because no maintenance work was done. The walls inside and out were covered with graffiti. And he did a lot of heroin. I mean, a lot. I quote John. I was very sad, and I was always happy when I was on drugs. Therefore, I should be on drugs all the time. I was never guilty. I was always really proud to be an addict. He couldn't even be bothered to cash his royalty checks. They were mailed to Flea's place, and one day Flea found his daughter scribbling on the back of a check made out to John for $600,000. There were some appearances. There was the band P that featured Johnny Depp and Gibby Haynes from the Butthole Surfers, but nothing came of that. He preferred to focus on painting, attempting to write screenplays, and messing around with a four-track recorder making demos. That resulted in his first solo album in 1994. It's called Niandra Lade and usually just a t-shirt. It's lo-fi, stream-of-consciousness stuff made with very basic gear. He says he didn't record the album on heroin, but he did record it while he was a heroin addict. But then, in an interview, he said that every note was played while he was on drugs. Oh, and all the songs were recorded in just one take. cannot separate that album from John's heroin addiction. Here's another quote. He was using at the same time because he believed smack was the only way to make sure you stay in touch with beauty instead of letting the ugliness of the world corrupt your soul. He'd say stuff like that during interviews where he'd shoot up. He'd spend hours on the roof of his house, which was up on stilts high in the hills. Here's another quote. My outfit for going up on the roof to wage war against the ghosts. Goggles and my ski mask, 
with every part of my body covered. No holes. Sweatpants tucked into my socks. You couldn't get into me on any level. It made sense at the time. He later learned that the term for this was cocaine psychosis, brought on by way too much coke and crack binges that would last for days. He once called Perry Farrell at 7 in the morning and asked, How do you get the snakes out of your eyes? When the album came out, fans were understandably confused. It sold just 15,000 copies. And then, in 1996, his house burned down. It started in the room where John did all his painting. There were a lot of paint cans and bottles of turpentine all over the place, so kind of a fire hazard. John was sleeping at the time and was knocked awake when the heat of the fire blew out the sliding doors on the room's balcony. He ran next door, got the neighbor to call the fire department, but he lost all his paintings, including two that had been painted by poet William Burroughs. Most of his guitars were fine, but when John escaped to New York after the fire, somebody came in and stole them. The only musical things that survived were all the four-track demo tapes that he'd recorded. His addictions got worse. By 1996, he weighed just 88 pounds and was described by the LA Times as a skeleton covered in skin. His arms were all scarred from where he deliberately cut himself, as well as needle marks from shooting smack and coke. He had abscesses everywhere. His teeth had rotted out, and he came down with a near-fatal blood infection. Everybody kept telling him to stop, but according to John, none of them could come up with one good reason why he should, even after he was admitted to the hospital and wound up technically dead for a few minutes. Somehow, John still found time to make music such that it was. In 1997, he released a record called Smile from the Streets You Hold, something he admits doing just to make some drug money. He was also verbally communicating with some kind of spirit. I quote, I was having verbal communications with the spirits while I was recording, and I started crying at the end of it. The spirits give you ideas for things, and what's important to them is what's important to me. I'm much more concerned with my fame in their world than with my fame in this one. That's why it's been difficult for me to adjust to being alive at all. John's buddy, the late River Phoenix, appears on a song called Higher Down. There's a track called For Air, where we hear John take a hit from a bong. And then there's the opening track, which is entitled Enter a a Dude does not sound good. I'm playing this to illustrate the depths of John's addiction. By hearing this, it'll eventually give you a better understanding of how remarkable his recovery was. It's a tough listen, but uh, let's go ahead. You see what I mean? That's the same guy who dazzled the world with his work on blood sugar sex magic. John knew that he could not continue as an addict. So in late 1996, after being on heroin almost constantly for five years, he quit cold turkey. Well, almost. No more heroin, but he still had his crack. And that continued for a couple of years. It wasn't until January 1998, when a longtime friend came for a visit that John was convinced to get serious about rehab. At the time, he had a lethal infection growing in his mouth, and if he didn't have all his rotted teeth pulled out and replaced with implants, he would eventually go into sepsis and die. That made it worth the $75,000 it cost for the new teeth. And all those abscesses on his arms? They weren't going to go away without skin grafts either. Thankfully, the rehab worked, and word got back to the Chili Peppers who weren't having a good time with Dave Navarro as their guitarist. He was fired in April 1997. Anthony was the first to reach out by going to a gallery event where John was displaying some of his paintings. Then Flea went by the house for a visit and broached the subject about John rejoining the band. Nothing would make me happier, he said. It was baby steps. John didn't even own a guitar at the time, so Anthony took him to a music shop and bought him a 62 Stratocaster to get him started. Everyone assembled in the garage at Flea's house, which had been set up as a rehearsal space. John was rusty, both physically and mentally. They started jamming, then they started writing, and eventually they started recording demos. Take a listen to this. It's from demos recorded in September 1998. It may take a little time to recognize the song, but we'll come here.
an early demo of Californication, recorded just as John was being welcomed back into the band after six years of drug hell. And for the next few years, things would be great. And then, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. There is part one of the long, strange trip of the Chili Peppers guitarist, John Frusciante. But we're far from done yet. Yes, he's back in the Chili Peppers by the end of the 90s. But he would leave again. And he would come back again. It's, um, it's complicated. But we'll do our best to untangle everything. There are hundreds of ongoing history podcasts available to download anytime you want from any platform you wish to use. They're all free. If you need music news and information on a daily basis, there's my website, a journal of musical things.com. You should really get the free daily newsletter too, so you don't miss anything. And we can meet up on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Oh, and if you need to reach me about anything, use Alan at alancross.ca. See you next time for more on the long, strange trip of John Frusciante. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.